Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this little guy right here. This is the Mercator Otter K55. Very interesting, very traditional pocket knife, and uh, looking forward to checking one out. Um, But first off, though, I want to thank my Patreon patrons, who not only make the entire channel possible, but made this one possible too. This was one that I was just sort of looking at and thinking, huh, I haven't checked one of those guys out, and that's kind of a, it, it's a cultural point in the knife world. Might as well look at it and think about it, you know, basically, is it still worth a damn in the modern era? And that's the question I'm going to answer today, but my Patreon patrons make every question that I answer on this channel possible. Thank you all so very much for your support. Next thing, let's do a size comparison. This is actually a larger knife than you might expect. If we put it up here next to the Spydeco Delica and the Ontario Rat 2, what we see here is that although the handle size is actually not that much bigger than the Delica itself, the blade length is, is quite long. Um, this is a reasonably sized blade. I'll um, put it up here next to the Spydeco PM2, and what we'll see here is that the sharpened blade length is pretty much identical on the PM2 versus the Otter here, and uh, if we put it up against the Open L number 8, another good old-fashioned sort of knife, what we see here is blade lengthwise, the Open L's got a little bit more sharpened length to it because it doesn't have as much of this little uh, Ricasso area here, um, but they are uh, very different, and actually, one of the things that's worth noting is a thickness comparison. The Open L is a uh, thick boy, and this guy is decidedly thin. I'll put this guy up here next to the Spydeco PM2, this is very, very thin. In fact, the, the, the slimmest knife that I have in my collection is this little guy right here. This is the Real Steel Real Slim, and what we see here is that they are almost equivalent in terms of thickness, um, and actually it's worth uh, doing a quick measurement here. What we're going to see is this guy comes in right around half a centimeter, a, a little bit more if you want to consider the, uh, the, the the stud height, basically, the, the pins coming off of there. This is a very, very thin knife right here, um, and that's probably its nicest kind of element to it. So um, there is that. Next thing, um, th th there were a bunch of variants of this particular knife, right? You've got brass, you've got copper, you've got steel. This is brass, as you can probably tell from the fact that it looks like brass. Um, there is a locking version, which this is. It has a basic back lock on there. Uh, there is a non-locking version. There is also a carbon steel version, which this guy is, and a stainless version. Um, th th that's that. Next thing, there is no disassembly because this is pinned shut. Um, and this is going to be a quick review because... Yeah, um, and then finally, um, the way I'm going to review this guy is probably going to come across as like, oh my god, to a bunch of people out there. I, th th for me, this is an institution. It's a cultural element. There's a, there's, there's a lot of people who are uh, sort of in love with the history of the knife, but my question is... Is this a good modern pocket knife? Is this something that somebody would want to carry here in 2021, given all the various options, given what this offers and what the price they're offering it at is? That's a very different question than the history of the Mercator Otter K55. Whole different thing. I'm just looking at this. Is, is the, can this still cut the mustard, so to speak, in 2021? So uh, let's go on ahead and jump into what I'm liking here and what I'm not liking so much. First off, um, this is technically an integral pocket knife. What I mean by that is that the handle of this is just one single piece of brass, right? And this is often viewed as a very high-end feature in modern pocket knives. This right here is the James Brand Barnes. What we see here is this is a titanium integral pocket knife where there is one continuous chunk of metal here. Um, that is, uh, you know, 600 bucks here. That is, uh, 50 bucks here. So it's the cheapest integral on the market. Well, actually, technically, the Open L is an integral, too. It's just a wood integral. Um, but either way, it is technically an integral. So, uh, yeah, enjoy that. Next thing, this is culturally important and causes nostalgia for a lot of people, right? This is a brand that has been along for around, that is, for a long time, as has this design, right? There's a lot of nostalgia. There's a lot of history here. Um, and to be clear, I think that's exactly why this still exists, right? A lot of people, you know, add somebody, bring one home from the war, so to speak. Or a lot of people, they're, they're, and this has been a thing even, you know, here in the U.S., right? This is a knife that's got some history. That is why it's on anybody's roadmap uh, as it stands, and I think it is important to highlight that. That's going to be a good thing for some people out there. Next thing, the blade on this guy is nice in some ways, right? Um, it is a, uh, in this case, this is the carbon steel, um, but that's, and that's all the detail they give. It's carbon steel, but uh, it has a relatively thin edge, comes down to a nice thin edge, so it actually does cut. It has thin blade stock. In a lot of ways, that's one of the things that the traditional style knives do best, is they, they are reasonably thin, and they are ground thin to cut well, right? Um, that's one thing that a lot of modern pocket knives have actually forgotten, and so it's nice to see that here. Um, this is a nice blade, and actually, to that end, this is an effective cutting tool, right? There are very few jobs that this will not do well, right? This will work uh, in a lot of ways. Is it the most comfortable thing ever? No, not necessarily, but at the same time, this will do the trick. 
right? Um, if there is a cutting task, there's a pretty good chance this will work for it. And so as a basic tool, this absolutely suffices. And then finally, on the on the good side, that is, um, the thing that is very best about this, and frankly, the only thing that is really outstanding here in the modern market is the thinness of this knife. There is relatively little out there that is this thin. Um, there are other knives out there, but this is just kind of barely there. Putting this guy in the pocket, um, it's just barely in your pocket. It's it's heavy, but it is so amazingly thin that this is really, really easy to put places. This is something that's thin enough that you could very easily, you know, you could stick it inside a notebook if you wanted to, or, you know, if, if you're being all, you know, I don't know, there, there are places you could put this guy. And especially if you remove the bail, then suddenly this guy becomes super duper thin. So it is super easy to carry, super easy to stash because of that, and that is the very best part of this. Um, So to me, all of that is the good, is that it is super slim. It is an effect cutting tool. It has a nice blade in terms of its thinness and its edge. Um, it is culturally important and nostalgic, and it is technically an integral knife, which is a high-end sort of thing to be. On the bad side, there is a whole bunch of ugly here. Uh, well, bad and ugly, frankly. Um, it, to start with, it is pin shot. So the, the, the way that it is running now is the best it will ever run now. Um, that's not necessarily terrible, and it is done in such a way that there's actually no blade play at the moment, which is good. And in theory, you could probably tap it shut a little bit more if you need to, but there's just no way to break it apart for um, the service or anything like that to replace. No, no, that's just not a thing. It is a two-hand open knife only. I understand that can be a legal benefit for some folks, especially in Germany, where these guys are made, but that is a thing to keep in mind. The bail on this guy is really hard to remove. If there is ever a reason to use a screw in a knife, this is one of them, right? Because this thing can be great for putting a lanyard or something on, but if you're just planning to carry this or tuck it away someplace... Having this be difficult to remove is not the play, right? I mean, you probably could do it, but it would take a little bit more doing, uh, especially to do it without harming the brass on there. So I'm not a big fan of the fact that that's not easily removable. I'd also like to see a clip on there, right? This is the Real Steel Real Slim, and this is a very, very similar knife in terms of slimness, but when you put a clip on it, it just becomes an order of magnitude easier to carry, right? becomes a lot more interesting. So I definitely miss the modern pocket clip. That's one of the best innovations that's ever happened to knife making, and uh, it's a shame that it ain't here. Next thing, the ergos on this guy are not great. They're not terrible, but they're not great either. And in the hand, you know, it is nice in that it is relatively thin, and it's got a little bit of tallness to it, but the biggest issue for me is actually this backlock part. Um, unlike a lot of modern backlock knives have a very flush backlock. This is also a backlock. The little bar sticks up when it's being deployed, as you can see here, and then hides back down away. And so as a result, the top of the knife is entirely smooth. Whereas on this guy, the backlock is sticking up all the time here, and then even when the knife is locked shut, this part is sticking up, so you've got a nice little corner right here sticking up right where your thumb wants to go. And that's not great. In a, in a, in a saber grip, it's a little better, but it's also, uh, I'm sorry, in a hammer grip, that is, it's just ergonomically, it doesn't super work that well. Um, and so that's not good. And then the back lock is just kind of sticking up as well. And on, especially if you close the guy, it's very easy for this little back lock here when it kind of pops back to give your finger a little bit of a pop or something like that. I just, I don't really care for it, right? Um, the back lock is just simply better recessed and both open and closed. Having this lock sticking up at the top just sucks, right? So it's not the end of the world, but ergonomically, I'm just not impressed. Uh, one other thing that's going to be really not impressive is this area right here. What we see here is this is the tang of the blade, and this is a sharp corner here, and it's just going to be sticking up at all times, and it's very easy to get something caught in here. Actually, at one point in time, I even managed to do one of these kinds of things as I was opening it, and given that was kind of a dumb way to open it, but where you can catch the, the media finger in between this little pincer area here, I just don't get it. That that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and this design is is really not ideal uh, as a result. I feel like they that, 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 bog, that bugs a lot of people in modern back locks, and it's probably going to bug them here, too. Um, all of these things so far, though, have been relatively little issues. Um, then we get into bigger ones. Like, what's the steel on this? Carbon. The thing is, carbon steel means many things to many people, and there are many different kind of configurations, chemistries, etc. Um, and they don't give you any more details that I've been able to find. I found one forum post that was claiming that the, 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 the stainless version was 1.403 steel, and that's not that far away from 420HC. It's not impressive, but at least it's got a name. But my normal advice is steer clear if they won't tell you what the steel is, because that probably means it's bad. And I feel like that's going to apply here. I mean, guys, I know it's an 
institution, but you can't just say carbon at this point. You have to tell us more about what you're using. Mysteries were fine 40 years ago, but in the modern market, with modern steels, people need to know what you're selling. And I imagine if they're not telling us, there's a reason, and we wouldn't like it. Next thing, and getting to be worse, the build quality here is being as charitable as I possibly could be, very rustic, meaning it's crappy, right? Um, the, the, the action on this guy is not amazing. It's got a lot of grinding to it. It's not a super even open. In this area, it gets a lot harder than before. And even with extra oiling on there, this just feels bad. And then the back lock, sometimes you have to push it in a little bit further. And given this will probably smooth out over more time, but it's just, it's a really unfortunate action. It's not super linear feeling. Um, the lockup on it is... I mean, it, it gets in there, but on occasion I have to push it back down in there deeper for it to fully lock up, which is bad. It closes with the blade slamming into... Hold on, let me grab a flashlight real quick and I'll show you. Uh, the way that this knife locks shut... Is, I'll zoom in a little bit here. You see that little groove? Yeah, that's where the blade slams down. This looks like some kind of a plastic or another. But that's how the knife uh, stops when it closes, when the blade slams into something. That's, um, that ain't good. And then the, the, the handle itself is actually a little bit warped. If you look at it closely, there's a little bit of push in on the handle in one area here. It's a little clearer if I put the blade in there. You can see, yeah, it's kind of pushing in more on this side than it is on that side, which is not great. I mean, this is just honestly, in a world of beautifully made modern pocket knives at this kind of a price point, this is really poorly made, right? I I can see the argument, oh, it's handmade, it's the way, it's the old school, it's the tradition. But the thing is, no, it's badly made. Uh, whether that's okay with you or not is a different question, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is well done. So um, the build quality is very rustic. And then finally, on the bad side, the price is 50 bucks. And look... I gotta be honest with you, this is a no-name steel and some brass, and a backlock that doesn't really fit in the space provided, and this is a knife that could make perfect sense at 15 to 20 bucks. You know, OpenL gets away with this because they're really cheap, right? But uh, this guy at 50 bucks, absolutely freaking not. There are so many amazing pieces available for 50 bucks with modern steels, modern construction, modern conveniences uh, that are built worth a damn. I just, no, absolutely not $50, Mercator. I am absolutely sorry. You really ought to rethink your pricing. So to me, all of that is the bad, is that the price is way too high for the build quality and materials. The build quality is bad. The, the steels are no-name steels. There's a huge gap when it's closed. The back lock is a little kicky, tending to kind of push up against your finger in uncomfortable ways as you're opening it. Um, it it's got a, uh, th th this back lock sticking up for some reason. The ergos aren't great. There's no clip. The bail doesn't come off it's two hand only and it's screwed shut look this is a nostalgia knife final conclusion flat out this is something that some people grew up with right um or maybe they remember maybe they've seen it online maybe they find it to be a neat throwback to an earlier and simpler time there are going to be a lot of people who love this knife for reasons that have nothing to do with this knife itself and if that's why you're interested in it more power to you but that's not what I'm here for. I am probably going to be viewed in your mind as missing the point, disrespecting a classic, all of that kind of thing, right? My job, the thing that I do in this, not my actual job, I got a real freaking job, but the thing I do here is to view things in terms of the current knife market. And the thing is, I cannot review this in the context of mid-century Germany, and it's of little use for me to do that, right? What I can do, and what I'm doing here is to ask whether it's still worth considering in 2021, in the world that exists now? And the answer to me is a resounding no, absolutely not, right? I mean, to be fair, it is not without charm. It's got the integral construction. It's got a cultural importance to it, a nice blade and effective function, very slim carry. But the thing is, it's also pin shut with two hand open. It's got no clip, a bail that can't come off. It's got poor ergos, a backlock that just kind of hates you up there. It's got weird gaps when it's closed and the, the, the thing there, a no-name steel build quality that don't compare and a price that is obscene for what they are delivering. And yes, again, I hear you shouting history, culture, tradition, grandpappy's knife. I hear you, but just work with me for a second, because imagine for one second that a brand new company came on the scene selling exactly this for $50. In the modern knife market, they show up at Blade Show, they got a whole table of this for 50 bucks with no-name steel, brass, backlock, crappy build. 
the thing is, you would just fall out of your chair laughing and you'd probably die of hilarity before you hit the ground, right? That is absolutely not an acceptable price point in the modern era because the modern era of knife making is absolutely amazing for 50 bucks, right? For 50 bucks, you can get pieces that are just beautiful, that have great grinds, that have decent steels. That's the CJRB Centros here. You can get designs with much more interesting approaches, different materials, things like that. I, I, you can get this for eight bucks. I'm just saying, guys. And you can get pieces that do a lot of the same things. This is the Real Steel Real Slim. Uh, by the way, that was this is the Artisan Arroyo. I'm just grabbing random knives that are better than this for 40 bucks, which to be fair, it ain't hard to do, right? This is just not a knife that would really make a lot of sense at this price point in this modern era. It can skate a little bit because of that tradition, but that's really the only thing that's letting this be. Now, the question then becomes, well, how much do you value the tradition and the history? Because that's the only way that this is ever really going to sell. In order for this to ever balance out, the, the tradition value history, or I'm sorry, tradition and history need to have their thumb pushing down real hard on that scale, right? Um, th th this is, if you're not interested in the tradition, if it's not historically interesting, then this is not an interesting knife. It's, it's not something I think you should even consider. If you like the tradition or or even if you're just really hip and want to use something old school and you need something that is thin above all else, then I guess maybe. And if you've been screaming internally this entire time because I'm disrespecting the past, then by God, is this a knife for you? But honestly, for most people, I'm going to send you elsewhere. And the, the easiest elsewhere to send you, the one thing that does everything this does just better is this guy right here. This is the Real Slim. This is also by a German, actually, by Helmut Jürmer. Um, But this is a, uh, it's the Real Seal Real Slim. It is a in a modern steel vg10 which isn't so impressive but at 50 bucks okay whatever it's also a locking knife in this case it's a liner lock and it's easier to use and you can actually hold the thing ergonomically it is just as thin as the mercada here i mean seriously if there is a different uh, difference in thickness it's not super perceptible it has a clip it is just sort of a nice illustration of everything you are missing by going here rather than here like i there is not a universe in which i would recommend this knife to somebody over this one uh, when this exists, uh, absolutely not. And so I guess that is my final conclusion here. If you are a collector of old patterns and you love the history, the tradition, the culture, grandpappy, the whole damn thing, then you know what? This is exactly that, and you can enjoy it. But that's because you're enjoying the story behind the knife rather than the piece itself. If you want a pocket knife that also has some tradition, then this is an option, I guess, but it's got some pretty considerable downsides, and I don't know that I would recommend it anyways. And if you just want a pocket knife in 2021, Honestly, you would have to work very hard to find one that is less impressive for the amount of money they're asking here. And so in that case, I think you really ought to look elsewhere. So anyways, I hope this has been interesting to you. Sorry to savage the, the, the past, but the thing is, sometimes history is called history because it should be in the past, right? Anyways, hope this has been interesting to you and have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.